Thanks to the organization for the opportunity for me to share uh, my experience, uh, Telefonica's experience in the space of uh, big data. Um, I have actually two, uh, two different streams in this uh, talk. One is on big data, uh, big opportunity, uh, big risks. And another stream is on uh, the role that Europe could play here. And we'll see if I can manage it within, within the time. Um, very briefly, an overview, uh, a bit of context about uh, Telefonica as a digital company, um, the big data opportunity, we've seen that a bit before. Um, uh, uh, some words on what is actually big data, because I think there are many, there's lots of confusions. Uh, some of the risks that I've seen as um, very crucial in making this happening. And then what, what kind of role can we play as a business in, in the big data space? Yeah? A few conclusions, and then uh, I'm going on to the, the Europe part. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, <clears throat> uh, Telefonica Digital is a new company, 18 months in, uh, and it basically groups together all the digital assets of the Telefonica group. Yeah? It's rather a big company, uh, 2 billion uh, in 2012 of revenues, uh, 5,000 people. So it's not a startup, although the culture tends to be, uh, of, is hoped to be a startup especially in moving forward quickly. Yeah? <clears throat> it is basically the answer to the digital world. We have new competitors. It's not, the, it's not Orange, it's not Vodafone, it's the big players, it's Google, it's Microsoft, it's Apple. Uh, those are our competitors and uh, that's why we decided to gather all those things together. Yeah? This is actually a snapshot of a website uh, of digital uh, in November 2012. And that was when we just launched a, a, a new business unit. Uh, you see it on the right, on the right hand side. It's called Dynamic Insights. Yeah? And that is a data proposition. It takes operator data, aggregates, anonymizes it, and then does all kinds of analytics, insights, and tries to sell access to those insights. Yeah? That's what I call a data, a data business. <clears throat> we have other things like, for you to know that we don't speak only about uh, phones and telecommunications, SMS. It's about financial services, e-health, um, communications, over the top, uh, even Firefox uh, uh, operating system, uh, cloud, etc. So it's really a digital business. It's not a telco. OK, the big data opportunity. Uh, I think this is already uh, some classical work uh, done by McKinsey that everybody cites. Yeah? On the left-hand side, there is really big data. More and more data is coming and prices to store data and to do something with the data is going down. And as a coincidence, there is a big, uh, big business opportunities. Yeah? Some numbers here of, that McKinsey gave, 300 billion uh, in healthcare, uh, uh, 250 billion in the public administration. Uh, I think the European Commission can be very uh, glad with that, <clears throat> et cetera. So really big, big numbers. Yeah? Um, but it's not only business. Yeah? There's also a lot of benefits to society. Yeah? Traffic management, uh, I think even TomTom, Tom, this uh, device to help you in the traffic, has a deal with Vodafone to buy its raw data, and then they use it to do, give uh, real-time traffic uh, indications. Public transport can be planned better, garbage collection, smart cities, illumination, e-health. I mean, there is a whole lot of things uh, that we can do with big data to improve the world. Yeah? So it's not only big bucks, it's also uh, doing things, uh, uh, doing good things. And it's not only, it's not that we're uh, there already. Yeah? Data keeps growing exponentially. Yeah? <clears throat> I think you know the, the figures. Uh, we saw it already today. Uh, 50 billion uh, devices connected in 2020. Uh, red square on the left, it's the amount of data 2009 and in 2020. It's increasing a lot. And interestingly, the part on the right is data that's out there and data that is properly protected. Yeah? So there is a, a lot of data that's going to be out there which is not pro uh, properly protected, which is related to one of the risks uh, I, I want to mention later on. Um, what is big data? Yeah? We all know the three Vs, volume, variety, and velocity. Yeah? I think everybody uh, that knows something about big data knows those. But actually, I think big data is also a big confusion and it's a big hype. Yeah? So there are also, uh, what people say, it's the myths about big data. Yeah? So it's not only massive data. Um, big data doesn't mean Hadoop. 
Uh, Hadoop is the, the, the open source platform to deal with the data. It doesn't mean unstructured data. Uh, it doesn't mean social media or Facebook or Twitter or sentiment analysis. And no SQL doesn't mean no SQL. Uh, um, there are also some other things, the three eyes of big data. It should be immediate. Uh, if you don't do it, something will happen. Uh, it is intimidating. What happens if I don't do anything with it? And it's ill-defined, as we said. Yeah? So summarizing, it is a hype. Yeah? So this is Gardner's hype cycle, I think, of last year. Um, if you look around the curve, uh, it's a lot of known terms. Yeah? And that's related to what I said before. Um, I really think that 70 or 80 percent of what's going on and currently called big data is just old wine in new bottles. It's just business intelligence, it's analytics, machine learning, people doing that for 15 years, et cetera. But there are a few things that are, are different. <clears throat> if you look, uh, let's take a, a, a bit of a closer look about big data and where it sits. Yeah? And this is from a telco perspective, but because in the end we are in a telco group and we actually, we, we actually did this evidence. So if you are thinking about what kind of role do I want to play in, in big data, then of course there's a lot of big data out there that you can use, but maybe you're also sitting on some of the big data yourself. Yeah? So uh, social media is the classical example, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, et cetera. Of course, there are weblogs of uh, big websites like Amazon, they have lots of big data on the weblogs. Network data, so all the data that's floating through the networks of tel uh, telecommunications operators. Uh, if you make a phone call, if you send an SMS, uh, if you do something else, all that data uh, is somewhere in the, the systems of, the, of, of a telco. And uh, <clears throat> it's used traditionally to optimize the network and to actually deliver you the service, uh, the service that you have uh, asked, asked for. But uh, there are also, it's also a gold mine if you can do other things with the data. Yeah? And this is really uh, something that is differential and that is not accessible for everybody. Machine data, M2M, eh? sensor data, uh, sometimes it's also SIM cards uh, data, also a huge opportunity. Um, then there is open data, uh, and there is transactional data, financial data, transactions. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. This is an example of um, types of big data that are out there, uh, are growing. And uh, if you want to play in this, just ask the question, um, how, how expensive is it for me to extract the data? Um, do I need it in batch or in real time? And is it really a strength of mine as a company, or can anybody reproduce it in a matter of uh, weeks? <clears throat> Taking advantage of all this data uh, and exploiting it is not easy. Yeah? So uh, some people claim uh, we are living on a privacy time bomb. Yeah? So on the, leg, on the left side uh, at the top, uh, in, the, in the 70s, uh, the nuclear energy looked very promising in the United States as well until an, an accident happened in Three Mile Island and basically it killed the industry for 30 years and when it started again a little bit, the, the disaster in Japan happened. Yeah? So uh, big events uh, may affect the, the, an industry and in my personal view, if we don't take care with our, uh, what we sp spoke about, data protection, privacy regulation, something may happen in the sense that something big happens and then suddenly it's over, next, uh, next chapter. Yeah? Every company is doing things in this space, um, is being watched uh, by regulators. Uh, data privacy is very high on the agenda of all the governments, of all data protection agencies, of the European Commission. Uh, whatever you're doing, as even small, if you are a regulated company, um, your steps are very closely watched. Um, there are lots of small data scandals, uh, things that happen. Uh, the classical one was with American Online in 2006 that released a lot of anonymous search queries and then within a few hours, uh, some journalists could pin, uh, pinpoint a particular person in the data and they made it happen and it forced the CIO to resign from them. Uh, it was a scandal for in the UK about form. It was about um, deep packet inspection without asking consent to the customer. So sniffing their internet data without telling. It was with uh, BT. So a big scandal uh, for them. Um, <clears throat> Google, you know it, they put a privacy policy together. Um, it's actually a very normal thing that all companies do. They want to harmonize the things. 
but because they are uh, it's sensitive data, there is a big fuss about with the Europe European Commission, the national data protection agencies. So it's a difficult place to be, and uh, um, this is related to how to take advantage of it and speed to market as well. <coughs> um, moreover, um, there is an increasing awareness in society about what companies are doing or what kind of uh, data our companies are storing. If you, uh, so this was an, a report that was issued by the Federal Trade Commission in the United States, and it obliged all the big telcos like Verizon, T-Mobile, etc., AT&T, to disclose uh, what kind of data do they store and for how long do they store it. Yeah? So that's something that everybody has an, probably an opinion about, but this was really an official statement where the companies were obliged to publish the data. As you can see there, uh, nobody stores the context of text messages, of SMS, except for Verizon. It does it for, did it for three days. Yeah? So <clears throat> it's not about the specific, specifics of this report, but those things are happening more and more. The society and, and, and we all are becoming more aware of what kind of the data that is being stored about it. Actually, we, have digit, we leave a digital trail whatever we do. And of course, that can be turned in something very nice and very good, but it can also be turned in something very bad. Yeah? So that's the, the, the trade-off and the, and the balance um, we have to find. And basically, for an industry, um, you don't know what to do. Yeah? So this is just a few snapshots of, of uh, industries uh, in this space companies, organizations that try to do something and basically, well, most of them got it wrong, yeah? So I, re I guess you re remember the, the, the scandal with PATH, yeah? There was this, this uh, social network uh, for very selected uh, uh, people with only maximum 50 friends. Well, without asking consent to the users, they, are, they took just your iPhone address book, uploaded to their cloud, etc. Yeah? So somebody discovered that. Uh, it was a scandal, and the CEO stood up, he did a YouTube video, and he said, sorry, we messed up, it won't happen again. Yeah? Um, that, you can do in the internet world, but if you are, let's say, what KPN, um, some executive uh, there said uh, something in an event that they were looking at uh, DPI data, deep packet inspections uh, of network data, to see whether they should uh, offer some clients uh, a tariff for uh, over-the-top services like WhatsApp, et cetera. And of course, you can't, uh, that was a very mistake to do that. And as a consequence, the Dutch, uh, Dutch uh, law uh, introduced now net neutrality. Yeah? So it's now basically forbidden to do that as the second country in the world. Yeah? <clears throat> um, so there are a lot of uh, companies uh, trying to do things. Uh, they really basically don't know what to do, so they just try. There's no best practice, and then they learn by doing. Yeah? So for instance, one thing that we trialed in the UK is that uh, in, in the sense of trying to give customers more control and transparency, so we gave them a portal within O2 where they can go in and they can look at uh, the data we have of them. Yeah? So they can say, okay, I want to see where I've been in the last two weeks. Yeah? And then you just, it's just uh, if, we, if we deliver a phone call to you, we know which antenna that is. Yeah? So we print it down, we, we, we draw that uh, on a map, and we inspect it whether uh, users like it or not. It was just a trial with, uh, I think, with a thousand, thousand people with explicit consent, etc. But basically, you don't know um, what uh, society and people think about how much uh, knowledge companies have or uh, don't have, what they use, et cetera. It's, it's, there's a lot of a lack of transparency. Yeah? And one of the things um, I think is key here is to improve transparency and control over, over those customer data. Even in the UK, uh, I think last year, there was a lot of uh, noise around an in initiative called Me Data. Yeah? It, was, it was run by Nigel Shedbolt as well. And this was about, an, uh, let's say, a voluntary initiative of companies to uh, tell customers what data they have, like energy companies. Yeah? So if you are with an energy company, the energy company tells you, look, this is what I think about your cons uh, consumption behavior, et cetera, with the, uh, with the objective. If you move to another energy company, actually you can take your data, you can put it to the other energy company, and they can immediately profile you and give you the right tariff, rather than starting from scratch. Yeah? I'm not sure how much traction that has, but that's the things that are in the air and are going to happen. 
So it's a complex thing, yeah? And apart from that, society is also changing. Yeah? And we actually, we don't know where it will stop. Yeah? So where, basically where we are today is that, at large, customers do not know what kind of data we have. Yeah? As, uh, and they don't know what's happening, whether it's Google advertising, AdSense, what data is floating, we don't know. Yeah? So where we are now going, and I think there is awareness that that's going to happen, is there is a trade-off. You use my data, I get something in return, either something for free, either a service, etc. But it's more a balance. Yeah? But really, where we need to go if we want to exploit uh, to the maximum the big data opportunity is that we need um, people in, in the world to say, okay, please use, use my data to improve my life. Yeah? So it's a matter of trust. You need a trusted uh, player where people are happy to give their data, and then a lot of innovation can happen. Yeah? That's, <clears throat> that's a challenge to get there. What I see as key uh, concepts that need to involve and are involving, so actually you don't know where it ends, is the distinction between individual personal data, aggregated data, and anonymized data. Very important to move forward, eh? and it's unclear. If you have personal data, all the laws apply. If you have anonymous data, no laws apply. Eh? But it's not that easy. Eh? And then there is customer consent, also a very important notion. Is it opt-in or is it opt-out? Eh? If it's opt-in, you have very little customers. If it's opt-out, uh, you have a lot of customers, but maybe you... So nobody knows where to do it. Yeah? And then you have another thing. It's, uh, there's the legal world and there is the society. If something is accepted, by the, uh, accepted legally, by your, signed by your lawyers, lawyers, it doesn't mean that it won't create you problems in the market yeah? because there is still the public opinion. Um, <clears throat> and usually... Um, um, there's not a lot of guidelines in, in what to do here. I think there was the only report I saw was of the UK Information uh, Commission officer on, uh, on anonymization. The report is over there. It, I think that's one of the best things uh, so far in the market. Okay, so with all this picture of the opportunities, uh, the risks, etc., what can you do? Yeah? So first what you can do, if you have a lot of data, you can use the data to improve your business. Yeah? Um, that is business intelligence, what many companies do. And in the digital world, the examples are Amazon, Netflix, and eBay. Yeah? So they use to the maximum their existing data to improve their business. Then, of course, you have the advertising businesses, yeah? where you said, okay, data improves the targeting, and therefore I can more, get more revenue. Google's model, Facebook's model. This basically is, uh, for, for me, this is, the concepts are the same as they've always been. Uh, simply, there is more data, and the technology has improved a little bit. Yeah? So if you look at those companies, they all use traditional uh, technology uh, data warehouses, and they use, in parallel, a big data platform. Yeah? Best of both worlds. Then you have the data, where the data itself is the business. Yeah? So it's the insights that you generate from data where the value is. Yeah? And you can give those insights, you can sell them, you can give them away if it's open data, etc. So it's the access to the insights. Yeah? So this is, I think, the real new thing in big data. So if I speak, or if we speak about big data, this is really the new opportunity that can transform uh, a lot of sectors. Um, and then you have a very new thing, um, which is related to, if you look on the, the left-hand side, it's all about getting data of customers and people, and then these people need to be protected so that the data is not abused. Uh, it's like a victim, yeah? And we need to, some institutions to protect the citizens against abuse. If you look at the right side, it's what I call the personal information economy. It's the customer at the center, yeah? I'm the customer, it's my data, I decide uh, whom, the, uh, whom the data is given to. If I give the data to Coca-Cola or to Google, I get something in return. Yeah? So uh, there are companies out there who are doing it. It's basically startup world. Yeah? So there are about 20 or 30 startups in the world. But very interesting. Yeah? So they take your data, uh, you decide what to do with the data, and then uh, they make all kinds of business. For instance, they say, okay, I, if, if I sell this data to Coca-Cola, uh, I give you 70% of, uh, of, of the deal. Yeah? So it's all kind of new things that open up, uh, but it's in its infancy. Yeah? And there it's not they, uh, cons customers as uh, victims, but really as active players. So I think that's a very uh, important area to watch. So as a conclusion on big data, yeah? um, I think three key dimensions. I mentioned them before. 
It's value, risk, and technology, yeah? And generally, it goes like this. The more data you have, or the, the, the higher the bigness of your data, uh, the more value you have. Of course, if you have so much data, a little bit more data won't create a lot more value, yeah? Uh, but here, really, the question is, where is your business model? Where do you find the data? Are you selling raw data? Yeah? Are you processing data and you sell curated data? Yeah? It's a bit of the open data, open data space. Are you selling the insights? So what Telefonica is doing now is selling the insights. Or are you all the way up to the application? So you don't sell specific insights, but actually you solve a problem. And I think this is the, 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 the difficult questions you have to ask in terms of the business model. And then, of course, there is the risk. Yeah? It's the, the privacy risk. The more data you have, the less likely is that at some point there will be a breach or you haven't handled the privacy uh, right, you haven't asked the concept, the consent of the customers in the right way, etc. So here the key is anonymization. Yeah? Try to get away from, uh, uh, from personal data uh, into anonymization data. And there's a huge amount of uh, work to do there. I think if there's one procurement thing that we spoke before in that could work uh, to really help this industry move forward is uh, to be clear on what anonymization means and what means re-identification. Yeah? And then there is the technology part, which is the more data you have, you move from traditional to a mixture of big data and traditional uh, in technology, and you move to uh, native uh, big data technology. Yeah? So those are the three things which are, in my view, relevant. Yeah? So I think this is what I wanted to tell you on, 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 uh, on big data. Now, <clears throat> I want to uh, take advantage of five minutes more just to give my view on, uh, on the opportunity for, for Europe, because big data looks like an ideal opportunity for Europe to, to make it, yeah? and we've seen that uh, so far. Um, now, if you take a step back and you look at the first, let's say, revolution in, uh, in the internet, um, if you look at this slide, I think everybody knows those brands very well, and there is one thing that this has in common, and there is, because that's, there is not one uh, European company uh, involved. Yeah? So my question is, um, is big data a second opportunity? Yeah? Now let's even, um, let's go a step uh, further back. I think we all agree that the Lisbon Council yeah, uh, failed yeah, the objective to become the most competitive and dynamic knowledge-based economy in the world in 2010. Well, I think we, we aren't, we aren't there as Europe. Um, and I think the Commission, uh, European Commission uh, also recognizes that. They had a very interesting report in 2012, 11, on the competitive, com competitiveness of Europe. And their statements were uh, things like, there is a widening gap between, the UE, the, between Europe and its world competitors, notably due to weaker business, business R&D investment. I think we know all that. Uh, Europe is losing ground uh, while remaining a top player in terms of knowledge production and scientific excellence. Uh, Europe is losing ground as regards to exploitation of the research results. Um, <clears throat> so again, uh, however, knowledge transfer in Europe remains weak um, and we are still striving to catch up with the United States. Yeah? So those are the things that I think You've heard, uh, you see it in all kinds of reports, uh, and really that is a big problem, yeah? Uh, SMEs, startups, uh, the US is doing much, much better than, uh, than Europe. Why is that? Huh? So personally, I also have some experience in uh, international research projects uh, here and in, in, in the US, and my observation is very simple. Huh? Uh, it's not a diagnosis, but it's an observation. So if, if you are working in advanced technology, I'm sure you all know the technology life cycle adoption, uh, the technology adoption life cycle of, uh, of uh, jo uh, Geoffrey Moore. Yeah, it's classical. It says it goes from innovators, early adopter, early majority, late majority laggards. If you're in the, one of the majorities, you become a millionaire. Yeah? If you're not crossing the chasm, which is the difference there, you, have, uh, you probably are playing in the margins. Yeah? You're alive as a company, but you're not making the big steps, and you won't be on my slide like the Googles, etc. So what's the problem in the United States? What's the challenge? This. You have to cross the chasm. Yeah? It's only 10% of the companies cross the chasm. Uh, they are in the early adopters market, uh, and some companies stay there for 10 years and then move over. Yeah? So that's the challenge. What's the challenge in Europe? 
So we have this innovation funnel of ideas, proposals, uh, use cases, then we want to launch. So basically, we never, we almost never get to the market at all. So there is no chasm that you can cross. Huh? I'm exaggerating, yeah, but uh, on, on, by and large, this is what, what, what I have observed. And if you look at the, 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 the literature and the numbers, it's, it's, it's like that. Now, um, there is a lively discussion going on uh, on a site called Quora, which is another interesting US, uh, United States innovation. And there was one person who asked, why do most of the successful startups come out of the USA? Yeah? Same question. There were eight, in, in no time, there were 81 answers, and every answer has a thread of a, a huge amount of comments. I just copied you some of them. But in the United States, you have 300 people you can sell to directly. Yeah? Here you have your country, and then you have to sell in other languages, in other country. I won't go over that, but very interesting ideas to gather out if you are a policymaker and you have to be uh, responsible for becoming more competitive. Um, but I think Europe is improving, uh, not because we want always. I mean, you see how Greek startups are doing their part to beat the crisis. Yeah? Spanish economic crisis inspires young professionals to launch startups. If you are approaching 40 in Spain, uh, you have a technology job, you are on the street, you can't do anything else than start your own business. Yeah? So there are always good sides at, uh, at bad sides as well. Um, private initiatives, um, so Telefonica, and this is not because I'm Telefonica, uh, Telefonica started an initiative called Waira. It's about giving seed funding to, uh, to startups across the world, except for the United States. Uh, it already has 200 companies funded uh, in one year. Uh, Nelly Cruz is visiting all the time, uh, but she likes this. And this really creates uh, companies uh, to get their ideas and to, and, and to help them, yeah, to improve the venture capital activity, etc. I think this is something that the Commission should have done uh, five or seven years ago. Yeah? So stimulating this, because we have a lot of activity at the research level, but then it stops, yeah? and then we have some entrepreneurs who try to make it happen, but they are disconnected. Yeah? Then, of course, there is Horizon 2020. I don't know the program from inside, so I hope there are a lot of uh, remedies for the things that we've seen until 2011, 2012. I think we really need to change a lot of things. And there are also lots of national government uh, activities, like the Open Data Institute in the U United Kingdom, which I think is very interesting stuff to uh, be more uh, innovation-oriented and going to the market with interesting ideas. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's very interesting the questions you're raising about the proper treatment of data and privacy and so on. Is there a case for a big telco company like Telefonica to develop a, a voluntary code of ethics or, you know, to, to lead the way in this? Yes. <clears throat> Actually, Telefonica has a, uh, a program called Digital Confidence which has been presented several times to the European Commission with a lot of commissioner officers, which is basically about, um, about it's also about uh, uh, child safety, etc. but it's also about transparency and control of data. Yeah? And it's all about being open on what kind of data you have and how you use it. And basically, it's a journey that uh, our company has to do. Uh, customers have to go through that same journey because we did a lot of user-focused studies and user studies, and, and basically people are not aware, most of the people are not aware of the information companies have about, about persons. Yeah. And actually they get scared if you tell them. So yeah, they exist. My name is Tony Shortle from Talage in Belgium. Uh, you mentioned some of the scandals say with data protection like form or whatever and saying that telecom firms are just going ahead on a trial and error basis. But I wonder to what extent do you think firms are not going ahead because of the fear of error? You know, so because it may be unclear or they may not be sure what is or is not allowed that there's a lack of development in fact. Yeah, so I think 80% uh, of the things that are being pushed within such companies are not going ahead. Yeah. And the ones that go ahead, still there are some problems uh, that arise. Um, it's Al Hajj Khalifa from Staffordshire University. Um, coming from university, so my question is related actually to the um, what do you think the um, university role in the area of big data? 
That's a very general question. It is a general question because um, um, uh, coming from academia, you want to know what you know um, the industry thinks about the university role and how university can be in, 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 you know involved in in, um, in the big data challenge. Well, I think one of the roles where uh, where a lot of uh, brain power is needed is what they call data scientists. Yeah? So once you have the data somewhere, you need to get the value out. You need to get the insights. Yeah? And I think uh, universities uh, are very well placed to uh, work in that space. I think there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of. Uh, it's one of the reasons it's in the. In the there is the hype curve. Yeah. So there's a lot of uh, interest in big data. Uh, many companies are taking decisions to do something. They start Hadoop systems. They get uh, data in there, and at one point in time, they will ask themselves. And now what? What do we do with all the data? Yeah? And then there, it turns out there is, there's not enough skills to analyze the data, or they can't find the people. It's a very select group of people who have the, the skills in-house. It's a shortage. Yeah? So I think there is an opportunity to create, uh, let's say, what we call machine learning out of the box, or machine learning for all. Simple things uh, that do 80% of the work, work, but it can be done by no non-data scientists, but by regular business people. I think there's a big opportunity in that space. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. That's great.